in verses 11 through 18, starting where we left off last week and uh, finishing this chapter. We, a couple weeks ago, we looked at chapter 12, and with chapter 12, we saw the red dragon. The red dragon is Satan, the, uh, the accuser, the enemy of God, the enemy of all, uh, of all the church, and, and quite frankly, the enemy of the world. I mean, Satan doesn't have any love for the unsaved any more than he has love, uh, love for the saved. Uh, but he tries to lead others astray so that he might be magnified, he might be glorified, and uh, to try to detract from God's glory. And a lot of what Satan does is a counterfeit. He takes what God has created what he, and perverts it. He... He uh, tries to usurp God's position, and we saw in chapter 12 that this red dragon is Satan, and, and, and Satan is uh, taking his position as, as the, and the counterfeit trinity, the evil trinity. The counterpart to the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is Satan, who takes the place of the Father. And then we have, in chapter 13, verses 1 through 10, we had the, the first beast out of the sea. And that beast was the Antichrist, who was trying to take the position of the Son. And this morning, in verses 11 through 18, we see the third person of this evil trinity, this counterfeit trinity, and that is the false prophet who tries to take the place of the Holy Spirit. So beginning in verse 11, it says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon, and he exercises all the power of the first beast before him, and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of these, those miracles which he hath power to do in the sight of the beast saying to them to dwell, that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, and the image of the beast, uh, that the image of the beast should both speak, and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark on the right hand or their in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. Dear Lord, I thank you for this day again for bringing us here as we look at. Uh, this uh, portion of Revelation dealing with a false prophet, Lord, we ask that you would help us to gain understanding, Lord, that we would uh, hear what you have for us, that we would uh, be able to sound the warning to those uh, who are around us of the coming uh, evil, the, the coming calamity, the judgments that are coming, Lord, and the uh, deceiver who will deceive many and and cause many to have no hope of salvation. Lord, I ask that you would uh, help us to uh, hear and hear your word, to listen, to be attentive to what you have for us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So here we have it, the second beast. The first beast that was the Antichrist, and he came up out of the sea, and he had the power to rule, and his power was given to him by Satan. Uh, and, and he was... He was hit by a fatal blow to the head and lived. And I believe that is Satan's effort to create his own Easter holiday. To, to create, uh, and that's what the prophet is going to be really be focusing on. The false prophet will focus on this miraculous healing of the beast, of, of the Antichrist. Look at, look at verse 11. We see the description of the beast. It says, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. So here is this 
second beast. And this second beast is, uh, it comes up out of the earth, and it says that he had two horns. And again, those two horns, that deal, that speaks of power. This is a, the second beast has power. And yet what we see, he doesn't have, like the other beast, are crowns. This beast has, has power, but he has no crowns. He has no political authority. He is a religious figure. He is the false prophet who points others to the Antichrist, who points others to the beast. And he has a certain way of speaking. He says he has two horns like a lamb, so he's kind of characterized as a lamb. And uh, if you've never been around lambs, uh, lambs tend to be pretty meek, pretty mild. There will be a sense uh, of humility about this false prophet. Uh, he's going to, uh, but, but he's going to have a way of speaking. It says he speaks as a dragon. I find it interesting that as you look at literature, whether you, you, know, you look at literature, you read books or whatever, and they have dragons. One thing about these dragons is uh, they're, they're very intelligent usually. Uh, they, people like to, to show them as being intelligent, and there's no reason to, to believe that dragons wouldn't be intelligent, but I find it interesting that they're always characterized as intelligent. And not only are they characterized as intelligent, but they're characterized as, as very smooth and convincing speakers. And that's uh, what this false prophet is, he, he's a lamb, he, he's characterized as a lamb with two horns who has, a, who has power, mm -hmm. but he speaks like a dragon and he's going to be a, a person who speaks with conviction and a person who speaks uh, with a certain level of persuasiveness. He's going to be very smooth. You know, sometimes uh, we have to be very careful about how we think about things. How we think about evil. Now, I'm not saying that don't think evil is evil because it is. Wickedness is wickedness, and it's always wickedness. Evil is evil, and it's always evil. But we have pictures in our mind of what evil looks like and what evil sounds like, don't we? I mean, when you think of Satan, what do you think of? When you when somebody says Satan, what image? pops up in your mind. How many of you have an image of a, of a red guy with cloven hoofs, a tail, and a pitchfork, and two horns coming out of his head? And Satan, man, it's like, you look at Satan, you're like, yeah, that's evil, right? Well, what does the Bible say he looks like? Right. The Bible says he appears as an angel of light. He doesn't look anything like the image we have in our head of him. And, and a lot of times we think that evil is going to come off as, as being evil. That will be obvious. And yet, what do we see in our world today? We see evil coming off as very persuasive and convincing, don't we? I mean, when, when you see uh, people talking about abortion, if they're not yet yelling in anger on either side... But when you see you know, people, people in Congress who, who talk about abortion and try to say this should be legalized, that this, should, this is good, and abortion should be okay all the way up until birth, uh, a lot of times, don't they sound pretty convincing? Don't they sound confident in what they're saying? And people start saying, well, that, you know, that kind of makes sense. You know, uh, the, uh, the LGBTQ community where they talk about we should be able to love anyone we want to love. Well, doesn't that sound good? I mean, doesn't it? Let's be honest here. Why shouldn't someone be allowed to love whoever they want to love? That doesn't sound unreasonable, does it? And yet, it's still wicked. It's still evil. They sound convincing. They make convincing arguments. And they're convincing arguments because they simply leave out the Word of God. And when they bring in the Word of God to their arguments, they twist it into something that it isn't. 
And so this false prophet, he's going to be a speaker with conviction. And he's, uh, he's going to be very persuasive. And in verses uh, 12 through 15, we see this power that he exercises. And he says, and he exercises all the power of the first beast before him. So the power that the first beast have, the power that the Antichrist have, he has that power. It says, and he causes the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Now you see that? He, he is going to convince people to cause them to worship the Antichrist. And what's the basis of this convincing he's going to do? It's a base on the basis that, look, he had a deadly head wound that was healed. And the, and the Bible tells us, we saw it last week, that not only did it heal, but it healed in the sight of men. He didn't go into surgery and have a surgeon work on him for 14, 18, 20 hours to fix the head wound. He got a head wound and it healed in front of everyone. Now I have to tell you that if I'm watching someone and, and they get a serious injury and I see that injury heal in front of my eyes... That's pretty convincing, isn't it? I mean, you imagine what what this would be, what the world would be like if that happened. You know, kid falls, breaks her arm. You know, it's kind of dangling there, and it just kind of knits itself back up. Goes off and runs the place again. You're like, wow, that's that's amazing. And so, the basis of this worship of the first beast, that the uh, second beast, that the false prophet is going to make. To, to convince people to worship the first beast is the fact that he healed himself. And if you wanted, if you saw someone heal themselves, you would really think, yeah, here's someone who should be worshipped. It is not unreasonable in human thinking to think that, is it? I mean, that, that's a convincing argument. I mean, you can sit there before he, before he gets that fatal head wound and so you should worship the beast, and people are going to be like, well, he's just another guy, what do I care? Get out of my face. And then you see, maybe he gets shot in the head, you know, goes right through his brain, you see the splatter, and then all of a sudden it just heals up. And then the false prophet says, worship the beast. And people are going to think, yeah, that sounds pretty reasonable. See, for us, we say, well, why would they want to worship him? And I say, why wouldn't they want to worship him if they saw that? I'm not saying worshiping him as right is absolutely wrong, but from a human perspective, isn't it reasonable from a human perspective, that they would worship the Antichrist after that. It absolutely is reasonable from a human perspective. See, all this deception that's going to go on in convincing people, there are actual reasons behind it that make sense when you think about it from a human perspective. Now, we have the advantage as believers, we know uh, we know what's going to happen. We know who the Antichrist uh, is, or better, we know who he is not. And so, we're not going to be convinced that there's going to be a remnant of believers, people who got saved during the tribulation period, both Jews and Gentiles, who, who aren't going to believe, who are not going to worship. But most people will fall into line. All of a sudden, you're going to have two religions instead of millions of religions in the world. You're going to have Christianity, and you're going to have, for lack of a better term, anti-Christianity. Those who worship Christ, and those who worship the Antichrist. There will be no in-between. He convinces these people from the performance of miracles that he has, calling fire from heaven. He convinces them by the miracle, miraculous healing of the Antichrist, and he deceives the whole world. 
He then commissions the people to create an image of the Antichrist. He doesn't do it himself, but he says, make this happen. You should, you should create an idol of the Antichrist. You should create a statue for him. And that statue is what you're going to worship because not everyone can be there where the Antichrist is. So wherever you are, you can worship this, this statue of the Antichrist. And not only when they build it are, are they going to be able to worship it, but it's going to become even more convincing. Because this idol that they create, whether it's made of metal or made of stone, or carved out of wood, the false prophet is going to bring it to life. And it's not just going to be moving around, but it's going to be able to speak. And that speech from the false uh, prophet's uh, life-given uh, idol is going to convince people to worship the beast. There's a series of miracles that happen here that are going to convince people that the Antichrist is the Christ. Let me tell you something. There's one thing that will end in the tribulation period, and that's atheism. There will be no atheists in the tribulation period, but not by the end of the tribulation at least. They're either going to be worshiping the Antichrist Worshipping Jesus Christ. And that's it. So he commissions this idol that he then makes alive, and that, that, uh, that idol can then speak. And anyone who doesn't worship the beast is to be executed. I want you to know that it, it doesn't say that they're going to be given a chance to be convinced to worship the beast Again, they just, you know, back in the days, if you think about like the uh, uh, the Spanish Inquisition, I know probably none of you were alive back then, probably. But the Spanish Inquisition, what would happen is they would gather these these quote unquote infidels, and they would have court, and they would, in the court they would give them one last chance to give allegiance to the church. And if they didn't, then they were executed or imprisoned. That's not what the Bible is telling us is happening here. They either worship the beast or they die. There's no other way. And may I say that if you see these miracles and you're not a believer, if, if you don't have the Holy Spirit indwelling you, and you see the miracle of the fire being called down from heaven, in, in front of the sight of men, and you see the miracle of the uh, false prophet uh, calling the, this idol to life, and then that idol actually speaking. And you see, uh, and you saw the miracle of the Antichrist wound being healed in front of you, and you don't have the Holy Spirit indwelling you, you're probably going to be convinced. It'll be absolutely convincing. And then, not only that, but the the uh, the false prophet implements a new plan, a new strategy. And it says in verse 16, that he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he have the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. And so the Antichrist implements the mark of the beast. He says everyone has to have this mark, but I want to point this out. I noticed this the other day, and we looked at several translations to kind of, and I showed it to Anne, and Anne was, she didn't really kind of understand what I was saying, because we've been so indoctrinated in some things, haven't we? But I, want, I want you to notice this. Look at what it says. It causes all, small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark on the right hand or on their foreheads. So you're going to have, you're going to have a mark, either on your right hand or on your forehead, 
He said, everyone has to have this mark. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. There's not going to be some exception because you're, you're a, you have a lot of money. And you're not going to be overlooked because you're poor. Both small and great, it doesn't matter if you have no power or you have a lot of power. Free or bond, it doesn't matter if you're a free person or you're a slave. Everyone has to have this mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And it says that no man may buy or sell. Without it, no one can buy or sell. Now, I want you to note this, though. We have it in our heads that they have to have the mark. And we have it in our head. What is that mark? Tell me what the mark is. Say it out loud. 666. That's what we have in our head, right? The mark of the beast is the number 666. But I'm going to ask you to look at this passage again. That no man, verse 17, might buy or sell, save he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Did you catch that word? The word or. May I say, there's, and I looked at a lot of commentaries, and there was no commentary that dealt with the word or. In our minds, how, raise your hand if in your mind, when you thought of the mark of the beast, you thought the mark of the beast was the number 666, and it went on your right hand, your forehead, and that was the only thing that you could have to buy or sell. Raise your hand if that's what you believe. Is that what it says? There's three options here. You either have the mark of the beast or the name of the beast or the number of the name of the beast, which is 600, 3 score, and 6, or 666. It appears to me, as I'm reading this, and I see that word or, and there's some translations where it has uh, no man may buy or sell save he have the mark of the beast, the name of the beast, or the number of his name. But there's always at least one or in there. That it's either the mark or the number or the name. That there's three choices. But, but what do those three choices ultimately mean is this. That they have sworn allegiance to the beast. Back in biblical days, and it happened you know, in all manner of slavery, quite frankly, even, even and there are slaves today. I'll, I'll tell you, there are slaves in America today. Human trafficking is alive and well in this country. But, when these people, when they have their slaves, they would mark the slaves. Sometimes they would brand them. Sometimes they would get a knife and they would scar them. Sometimes they would put a certain piercing in their ears. But there would be some way of marking them that they belong to this person. Just like you brand cattle. Anyone here ever been on a cattle ranch? You know, you brand cattle. Cattle get, cattle get brands, you know, and usually that brand is a hot iron, though nowadays they have technology they use, uh, they use liquid nitrogen to cold brand cattle, turn their hair white uh, in a certain pattern. But, but they're branded to say, this is mine. In the Old West, you branded your cattle, if somebody took your cattle, then you would identify it by the brand and and there was a stiff penalty for cattle rustling, usually hanging. And so, what this means though is, is that this mark, whatever the mark is, and I don't know that the mark of the beast is the number 666. It could be some other type of mark. Uh, but I'll, 
tell you this, and, and don't take this as a, you know, a pure anti-vaccine position, but we're getting to that point, aren't we, in America? I mean, I can picture a day where they say you have to have this vaccine to do anything. Can you see that coming? And I'm not saying that the vaccine is evil, and I'm not saying you shouldn't get the vaccine, but what I'm saying is that society is leaning towards a place where it would not be considered unreasonable or out of left field to, to have a certain thing to be able to do what, what you want to do, to be able to buy and sell. Think about it. Social security number. What's your social security number for? What was it designed for? To identify, to identify you specifically so that you could get social security payments. And what did they say when the social security number first came out? That it was not to be used for identification. Right? Social security number was supposed to be used just for that. You gave it to your employer so they could, and that would identify you that you're paying into social security so when you retire, you could draw money from social security. But now, what do you need your social security number for? You have to have it for everything. Anyone here ever applied for a credit card recently? First thing they ask you for is social security number. <coughs> And let me tell you something, the credit card bureaus, they can get everything they need off of you, about you, from your social security number. When I worked at JCPenney and we had the thing, they, they said we had this really quick process at JCPenney, people apply for, uh, for a credit card, the first thing they do is put the social security number in, then they have to fill out all this other information, you know, name, address, you know, income, do they rent or own, all this stuff. How many of you have done something like that before at a, at a store? Raise your hand if you've done that. But for the guy from, from, the, uh, from the credit card company that JCPenney uses, said, we got everything we need off the social security number. We don't actually need any of that other information. Because they got everything off the social security number. The process is in place to identify people easily with numbers. We do it all the time. And the process is in place, or getting in place, where, where people are not going to have a second thought about getting some kind of marking or some kind of identification to be able to do whatever they want to do. Try to get credit without a social security number. You're not going to get it. And so we think, oh, no big deal. And, and again, I'm not saying that that's necessarily evil in and of itself, but, but I see the path prepared. And if everyone had to get a single thing to, to be able to buy and sell, I could see some resistance to that, but there's options here. The mark of the beast, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name, 666. All of which mean one thing. That they've given their allegiance to the beast. May I say this. For those who take that mark, their fate is sealed. I am a believer in, at this point in time, and that as long as there's life, there's hope. If a person's still alive, there's a hope that they will come to know Christ as Savior. But in the tribulation period, when the mark of the beast is implemented, once a person gets that mark, there is no more hope. A person who gets the mark of the beast, a person who swears allegiance, that swears fealty to the beast, can no longer be saved. And we take a lot of hope in, you know what, if, if, you know, I have family members who aren't saved, and sometimes we take hope that, well, if, if the 
if the rapture happens and they go through the tribulation period, they've been taught about the tribulation period, and so maybe they won't buy into it. Maybe there's hope. And maybe there is. Up until this point. Up until the point where they take this mark, where they swear allegiance to the name of the beast, where they take the number of his name on them. And then there's no more hope. You see, Satan wants to be God. He knows he's defeated. I am convinced that Satan knows he's defeated. He just wants to drag as many people down to hell with him as he can. And so even though he knows that he has no power over Jesus Christ, that he has no power uh, over, over God, that he cannot beat God, he's still going to try. And he's going to set up his unholy trinity with him as a father, the beast, the Antichrist, as his son, and the false prophet as the Holy Spirit, pointing people to the to the Antichrist, and the Antichrist being worshipped as God, and, and Satan also being worshipped as God. And it says, Here is wisdom, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, his number is six hundred, three score, and six. Six hundred and sixty-six. There's a significance to that number. I don't buy into a lot of numerology in scripture. I do believe that there are some numbers that are significant. I think there's a lot of people that make a lot of numbers that significant that really aren't that significant. But may I say this? This is a significant number. This is a number that, that we can't mess with. This is a number that, that, that we need to warn people about. I wonder sometimes, you know, we have some of these, particularly these hard rock, acid rock groups, whatever they're called nowadays, I don't know. And they, I've seen some of them with tattoos, 666 on their bodies. And I wonder, is there any hope for them? Does that count? Or does it have to be in the tribulation period? You know, the beast is coming. The Antichrist is coming. Satan is promoting his agenda. And what we see today, I see it as preparation for what we saw in Scripture today. I'm not saying, don't go away here saying, Pastor said we shouldn't get the vaccine. I did not say that. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying, be aware, be field aware of what's happening around us that is preparing the way for the Antichrist. That is preparing the way for worship of the beast. For worshiping Satan in the tribulation period. Because it is coming. Let there be no doubt about it. And whether the mark of the beast is 666, that is visibly 666, or if it's some particular tattoo, Or, or just a, a, an oath of allegiance to the to the Antichrist that must be taken. If there's choices there, that we have to be careful. You know, things have been heading that way for a long time, and we're starting to see the snowball getting bigger. We can look through history, and we can see. Things changing. It started off slow, but it's picking up speed. The time is at hand. I don't know when Jesus Christ is returning, when he's when he's going to rapture the church into heaven. I don't know when the tribulation is going to start. I don't know specifically who the Antichrist is. 
But you know what Jesus told us? He says, you need to know the signs. And the signs are there. And it doesn't mean that these things that I'm seeing as signs are necessarily evil in and of themselves. But they're just a pathway, an open door to what is coming. Dear Lord, I thank you for this day. Lord, I ask that you would open our eyes to what is going on around us, Lord. As we see the world heading in the direction it's heading, that as we, as we uh, see the decisions that are being made in governments, the decisions that are being made by people, the wickedness that is so prevalent and so accepted in our world, Lord, that we would recognize all these as as things that are preparing the way for the Antichrist, that are preparing the way for the wholehearted worship of Satan by most of the world, Lord, that they're preparing the way for uh, the events of the tribulation period, Lord. Help us to take these as warnings to uh, not waste our time or to, to take warning to, to share the gospel with those around us, friends, family members, acquaintances, even random strangers that we might meet, Lord, that we would share the gospel with them, that they might avoid the events that we see in the book of Revelation. In Jesus' name, amen.